Thank you to our section chair, Dr. Rowan Barris, and the CCAC organization for this amazing opportunity to share my research. Joseph Mallard William Turner was one of the most influential and celebrated artists in the 19th century. In his lifetime, he produced over 30,000 pieces of artwork from sketches, studies in pencil and watercolor, as well as over 500 oil compositions. In my presentation, I discuss the turning points of the Industrial Revolution in Northeastern England and the artistic methods in which Turner responded to them. Because Turner's style was so unique compared to his artistic contemporaries, the intelligence and psychological storytelling found in his work turned the tables of art history and shaped how landscape paintings were interpreted at that time. By juxtaposing several of his works, for example, the watercolor of Annick Castle to Kilman Heaving Coals by Moonlight and articulating the intrinsic qualities of certain atmospheric attributes of the sublime, we may begin to see the tides of change in industrial England, including a subtle shift from history paintings to art representing the industrial working class. In seeking out these subtle and sometimes poignant changes, I hope to effectively punctuate, through Turner's work, the Northeast's unique position in helping England transition from an agri agrarian society to the most formidable world power during the 19th century. This is a small map to put in context the area that I'm discussing in this presentation. This includes the northeastern counties in North England, uh, that include Northumberland, County Durham, Tynum Ware, and North Yorkshire. One of the best examples Turner gives his viewers of the agricultural past in northeastern England is in his several exemplary compositions of the grand medieval castles nestled among the rolling landscapes in northeastern England. Turner made several visits to the counties of Northumberland, Tynan Ware, and County Durham during his lifetime, notably from 1793, 1817, and 1823, where he produced a myriad of sketches, watercolor drawings, and of those, several oil compositions. Mostly these types of compositions were commissioned for various patrons of nobility such as his work, Raby Castle, the seat of the Earl of Darlington. In this early work for Lord Darlington, who was a dedicated, if not obsessed, sportsman, Turner explicitly conveys the full extent of the castle's vast holdings and topographical opportunities conducive to the hunt. As was the custom of patrons, Darlington likely influenced Turner's artistic themes for this work, but Turner nonetheless exhibits, in part, the pastoral pleasures of a less complicated time. A seldom seen element of Turner's style lies in the foreground composition of Raby Castle. Turner uses a wondrous amount of botanical detail in the local plant life being depicted closest to the viewer, going so far as to carefully highlight each leaf and striation associated with various native varieties, suggesting an emphasis on the flora and fauna of the area. This stabilizes the composition in the lower register, contrasting ever so gently with the heaping up of clouds starting to darken, congregate, and swirl directly above. In contrast to the happy pursuit of the past in the lower half of the painting, and as one of Turner's most successful house portraits, Raby Castle exhibits one of the first of Turner's compositions where he, util where he utilizes the full power of the perceptible potential of the sky. Indeed, a subtle shift begins here in the value and grouping of the cloud formations in the top left of the oeuvre, drawing the viewer's eye upward, right, and back down to the hunt scene in a subtle comparison of activity from the foxhounds in full chase on terra firma to the possible threat of an early morning deluge shown in the celestial realm.
A valid question to ask would be, is Turner beginning to articulate the changes of his country's advancements during the Industrial Revolution, albeit subtly, in this work? Is he suggesting a change in the way of life in the Northeast from a mostly agricultural economy to that of invention and industry? One barely senses the existential concern of man's vulnerability in the impending delivery of nature's force in the gathering clouds, but stealthily and steadily is the presence and garnering of meteorological forces. Here is locomotion number one, engine at Darlington from 1825. The etching was printed uh, in 1862, and the artist is unknown. Compared to the historical timeline of the Industrial Revolution in England at the time Raby Castle was sketched in 1817, much of it corresponds with the geographic northeast in the 1816 patent of the locomotive steam engine by the northeastern born and father of the railways, George Stevenson. These engineering advancements may have been at of particular newsworthiness near the town of Darlington in County Durham where Raby Castle is closely situated and where later locomotive number no. one made its debut in 1825 as the first passenger railway line Stockton Darlington. Turner who was intensely interested in science, nature, current events and a voracious reader would have sought out information about such inventions and advancement during this time. Given the growing number of publishers and printers in England's Northeast in the late 18th century, up-to-date news was not only relegated to London. It is reasonable to surmise, although nothing is specifically written about Turner's response to the railway at Stockton Darlington nor the 1816 patent of George Stevenson, that Turner would have had some knowledge of these groundbreaking developments and may have, as early as 1817, started to express them in his artistic work. This is locomotion number one at the Darlington Railway Center and Museum, and this is the first prototype of the first passenger steam engine. Shifting now to Annick Castle, Turner's subject at Annick is the castle seen over the Lime Bridge shown here. It is one of the largest and oldest palace castles in northeastern England and the current seat of the Percy family, which are Dukes of Northumberland and have been since the 1300s. The castle and bridge were renovated in the fashionable neo-Gothic style around 1775 by Scottish architects Robert and John Adam as part of extensive work on the castle and estate. The stone lion on, the, on its parapet emblem of the Percy family is shown in Turner's sketch on the left and my personal photograph of the castle to the right. Originally sketched on site in 1797, Turner selected this sketch for a watercolor composition some 30 years later. He chose to show the castle by moonlight in a revisit of his original, which adds an element of the ethereal to the architectural style. The scene at Annick Castle is quiet according to Professor David Hill of Leeds University. The moon rise in the composition would have had to happen near midnight in midsummer by its particular placement. It is a testimony to two certainties. Turner was a precise draftsman and secondly he encapsulated the quiet beauty of the northeast in this work at a time before industrialization began to make an indelible footprint. In this full moon vista of the castle, Turner seeks to establish a connection to something beyond what is known and seen. He hearkens to the sublime or perhaps to the not yet realized. His work seems to indicate there is something else that we might imagine or perhaps even glimpse if we concentrate intently enough. In Annick Castle, one may sense this otherness of a dream world or perhaps the veil between the realms of consciousness. 
In art history terms, we may place this work as a history painting representing one of England's oldest and most influential aristocratic families. This is Kilman Heaving in Coals by Moonlight. Here I've tried to match Turner's palette in a juxtaposing composition of a scene south of Annick. The city of Newcastle was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution by the turn of the 19th century. Pictured here is the River Tyne at Shields, a town slightly downriver from Newcastle. Coal mine nearby was loaded here into small barge-like vessels called keels. The keels were navigated across the shallow river, then their cargo was transferred onto large ocean-going ships waiting in the harbor. The most frequent destination was London, which was the main consumer of coal from Newcastle. The smokestacks and signs of industry transformed the marine and land vistas of England. Work, too, was transformed as laborers toiled in continuous shifts to meet the demands of a growing economy and population for fuel and other raw, raw material. The changes wrought in English life by industrialism intrigued Turner and captured his imagination. Notice the color palette of these two works is quite similar, unifying atmospheric complexities of a full moon nightscape. Both works exhibit a brilliant light source in the moon with reflective properties of water in similar ways. However, although these two works complement and echo each other in these attributes, they are significantly different in their purpose and meaning. Kilman Heaving in, in Coals by Moonlight introduces motion and activity in the red in the reds and gold of the smokestack fires to the right. We see people working, heaving coal from small flat bottom keels and onto larger seaworthy vessels so using sacks, shovels, and baskets, working hard and long hours into the night. Back breaking work to supply the demand of the day for coal to few fuel the new industrialized economy in places such as London. In Annick Castle, we feel as if we are peeking into a sleepy hamlet. Only the deer who are grazing and resting are awake. There may be some light coming from the windows of the castle suggesting some work is still being accomplished, but overall it is sleepy, contemplative, and dreamy, indicating an era of English history where agriculture and rural environments of the aristocracy speak of a more nostalgic time. In Kilman, we sense that the work will never be done. There will be no sleep this night or the night after. It is often interpreted as a meditation on the rise of maritime powers with Kilman celebrating Britain's industrial ascendancy. The Frosty Morning was reportedly Turner's favorite composition and remained with him throughout his life. Looking to Dutch landscapes of the 17th century, it is similar in horizon line as Raby Castle, with a much closer perspective of a seemingly ordinary country scene. The stark bare trees break the horizon line in this composition, drawing the viewer's eye upward to a quiet frosty dawn sky in England's New Yorkshire region just south of Darlington. It records a scene he witnessed while traveling in Yorkshire and is said to include his eldest daughter, Evelina, in blue, and his crop-eared bay horse pulling the cart. Years after Turner's death, artist Claude Monet saw it and declared it had been painted with, quote, wide open eyes, unquote. Wide open eyes is how I choose to interpret this scene, too. The scene shows a presumably father and daughter who have happened upon workers clearing or digging out a ditch. The father and daughter have just returned from what looks like a hunt, and he is holding a musket or rifle, and she is adorned with the carcasses of rabbits or hares. London author Peter Ackroyd, in his book, J.M.W. Turner, Remarks, as with a lot of Turner's more naturalistic country scenes, the narrative remains, quote, oblique and mysterious, unquote. I disagree. The cart, picks, and shovels shown just below the cart 
may be a nod to everyday manual labor exhibited by these workers. However, given the date of this composition and the geographic relevance to what was happening in the Northeast at this time, the tools could be significant of a greater message. The frostiness of the earth and sky pair harmoniously to set the overall tone of the composition, bonding the celestial and earthly, which may give it some spiritual connotations. A peak of the sublime and the rising of the sun is seen in the lower right horizon. The eye is drawn also to the cart and what sort of large chest is being carried in its back. The handle of the shovel ever so slightly echoes, echoes a similar slant as the leafless tree in the immediate background while its metal portion stabilizes it firmly in the ground. The two vertical lines juxtapose and the vast expansion of the early morning horizon. Is Turner subtly guiding his viewer to consider industry where the same tools used in agricultural, agricultural work may be lent to the Kilman's work in heaving the coals needed to fuel the economy of London and other urban places? Maybe he is making a very quiet reference. Perhaps it is simply a nice country scene. What isn't quite understood is what is the girl facing in the foreground and middle ground? It seems muddled and black in appearance. Was something there that is now gone only leaving an impression of what was there? In addition to the tools being referenced, there could be a moral message of poverty in the eyes of progress. The poor working harder and longer and never reaching a reasonable level of economic security. According to author and historian Jack Lindsay, who writes, quote, In Frosty Morning, any previous landscape narratives involving the working poor have been realized in fully eradicating any advantageous, anecdotal, or trivial aspects of men at work, unquote. Here is a close-up detail of the Frosty Morning. And it shows the detail of the father and daughter grouping, as well as the horse cart and the, the tools that uh, the workers had been using, as well as that dark uh, mass that, that seems strange in the composition. Here in Newcastle on Tyne, Turner depicts the city and the adjoining town of Gateshead looking west with the river Tyne running between. The river is crowded with shipping keels, wherries, steamboats, and other small craft. From the left to right are the city's most conspicuous historic landmarks. First, the Tower of St. Mary's at Gateshead, and next to it, the Tyne Bridge of 1772. Above the bridge is Ellswick Shot Tower for the manufacturing of lead, sheets, pipes, shot, white lead, red lead, and litharge. The metal was mined in the nearby towns of Stella and Swalwell and was then transported to the tower for processing. To the right of Ellswick is the keep of the 11th century castle and next to this is the spire of the 18th century elliptical church of all saints. The last landmark to be featured is the medieval steeple of St. Nicholas's Church. Here Turner combines historic architecture and its historic implications to the new industrialized view of the city. By showing both the old and new, Turner transitions the history painting to represent the new changing England. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of a photograph from 1887 of the same area that Turner painted back in 1823. And here you can see the, the spires of the church and, and pretty much are able to match it up exactly to Turner's work as well as the old time bridge of 1772 which we see in both, in both works. J.M.W. Turner 
portrayed the changing economical, social, and topographical environments of England's Northeast during the throes of the Industrial Revolution, and comparing compositions of the quiet castles of the area with scenes of commerce on the river such as the Tyne, Turner effectively marries the change in a complexity of emotion and spirituality as reflected in his renderings of the sublime. In comparing and contrasting many of these works, a correlation may be made as to what Turner thought about his country's progress and the effects of the progress on the English people during the, this time in his life. Turner used a few methods in getting his points across on canvas, sometimes blatantly as in Kilman Heaving Coals by Moonlight, and sometimes more subtly as we, see, we saw in Raby Castle, with the subtle changes of the atmosphere. Other times, in the smooth, flawless composition of, fro of the frosty morning, we may surmise Turner's empathy with the workers as they toil on a very cold winter's morning in their everyday country work and how that quiet graft was about to become hectic work done around the clock in environments contrary to the sun up to sun down of an agricultural economy. Turner's time in England's Northeast, and consequently his resulting work, is a testament to progressive change from an agrarian society to that of commerce as a result of the Industrial Revolution rooted in that area of the country. Thank you.